and he's a jazz historian. He's been performing for decades, yes. He studied and graduated from Berklee College of Music, Boston, and he also got his graduate degree from Rutgers University, New Jersey, in performing arts and education. He's performing worldwide. He's been performing worldwide, and he is happy to be here today to share his knowledge and to also embrace you with his melodic sounds. Without any further ado, I give you Galen. Thank you. 
Where's the year 1910? 1910 in America. Gee, you could buy a loaf of bread for only eight cents in 1910. The Model T was just being rolled out of the Ford Motor Company. You can buy that for $550 in 1910. 1910 welcomed this first Negro. African-American millionaire, Madam C.J. Walker. That's right, she had her roles and she was sporting that fella too. 1910, 80,000 people converged into Carson City, Nevada, right outside of Reno, you know, to see the first Muhammad Ali, the first Mike Tyson, Jack Johnson, was up against the great white hope at that time. His name was Jack Jeffries, and he swore that he would never give Jack Johnson a chance for the title. The, fi the fight was scheduled to go 21 rounds, but Jack Johnson knocked out the great white hope in only 15 rounds. The photographer had to stop the film before the great white hope went down on the canvas. The music was heavy. The jazz was swinging. The people were celebrating, but soon thereafter, riots broke out from coast to coast because you see, this country was always two Americas, one white and one black. 1910, over 115, 114 to be exact, HBCUs were built at that time. They were all completed, and Fisk University was the Yale of the South. Even white folk vied to get into Fisk University because of its high standards. People of color owned things in 1910. By the time we got to 1920 to 1921, there was the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma where there were black banks and there were black insurance companies. And more people of color were homeowners and landowners than ever before. But all of that came to a screeching halt when there was a lie that was made up about a young man who had accidentally stepped on a white woman's toe in an elevator in Greenwood, Oklahoma. Riots soon broke out in 1921 and the entire Black Wall Street was burned down. But at this time, RCA Records and Columbia Records and Dial Records were recording the Negro sound. There were race records that were so only supposed to be consumed by people of color. But when these records were selling like hotcakes, White folk wanted to emulate this great, great sound known as jazz. And believe you me, the ladies were not left out. There was a young lady from Chattanooga, Tennessee. She was called the Empress of the Blues. And she started out singing at a very, very early age in her life. Oh, she had it rough too. 
She sang on the streets along with her sister, and they would sing for pennies until the big record companies picked her up. And did she make a hit? Her name, I'm quite sure you know who I'm talking about, is the late, great, the sweet Bessie Smith. Bessie Smith, born on April 15th, 1894 in Chattanooga, Tennessee, passes away on a Mississippi highway, specifically Clarksdale, Mississippi, due to an automobile accident on September 26, 1937, at the tender age of 43 years old. But before she leaves, she leaves us with a wonderful library, a beautiful legacy of her message, shrouded in the music. Bessie Smith was one of the greatest civil rights leaders and one of the greatest vocalists of all time. Here she is in a small group ensemble situation. This was recorded in 1922. The name of this one is entitled, Give Me Some. Loving is the thing I crave. For your love, I'd be your slave. You gotta give me some. Yes, give me some. Can't you hear me pleading? You gotta give me some. Smith, what, what a vocalist. And as you probably noticed by now, it mentions that she was a torch singer. Well, a torch singer was simply one who sang about the hardships between her and a lover or an employer. And she would put these words into her music. Bessie Smith, one of the great ones. You know, when I was coming up, we didn't even have TV. So we had to imagine what the person on the radio sounded like. It was great. You know, it's commonly said that TV would make your mind lazy. Watching images all day long. And when TV, when we did get a TV, we were the first ones to get the TV on our block. And we were so happy, sure. There were only three channels. There was ABC, NBC, and CBS. Oh, we didn't care too much about ABC because it didn't cater to the Negro population. But NBC and CBS did. We had Amos and Andy in 1951. We had The Beulah Show, which starred, well, our next featured lady. And then we had the Nat King Cole show, and we even had the Harry Belafonte show on NBC. Oh, we were so proud at that time because, you see, we were able to see ourselves on the small screen. This next lady was from Chester, Pennsylvania. She did have her own show on CBS, and she played a maid that wasn't going to kowtow to any white folk at all. Her name was Beulah. She was one of the greatest black minstrel vocalists of all time. She was one of the greatest civil rights leaders and one of the greatest actors and philanthropists for Dr. King. From Chester, PA, that's right, her name was Ethel Waters, one of the great ones, Ethel Waters born on October 31st, 1896 in Chester, PA, passes away in New York City on September 1, 1977, at the tender age of 80. 
of uterine cancer. But before she leaves, she leaves us with a great, great message as well. Here she is, again, with a small group ensemble. And this was recorded in 1935. The name of this one is entitled, I Got Rhythm. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who could ask for anything more. I got daisies in green pastures, I got my man who could ask for anything more. Old man trouble, I don't mind him, you won't find him round my door. I got starlight, I got sweet dreams, I got my man who could ask for anything more, who could ask for anything more. Days can be sunny with never a sigh, don't need what money can buy. Birds in the tree sing their day full of song, why shouldn't we sing along? I'm chipper all the day, happy with my lot, how do I get that way? Look at what I've got, I got rhythm. And I've got music. I got my man who could ask for anything more. I've got daisies, but they're in green pastures. I got my man who could ask for anything more. Old man trouble, shucks, I don't mind him. You'll never find him round my door. I got starlight, and do I have sweet dreams? I got my man. Who could ask for anything more? In fact, who wants anything more? The late, great Ethel Waters. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful genius she was. You know, big bands were very, very popular during the 30s and 40s. And there was an old myth that would circulate amongst the community both black and white community, that girls had a problem in understanding the concepts of mathematics. And we knew that that was crazy because of, it was just crazy, period. There was a guy in a little town called Piney Woods, Mississippi that would dispel this crazy myth that girls had a problem understanding the concept of mathematics. You see, musical notation is the highest form of mathematics. We have the whole note, the half note, the quarter note, the eighth note, the 16th note, the 32nd note, the 64th note. And sometimes these notes are tied over into what we call the next measure. There are rests, and there are other notations that would afford the musician to actually count the music. You must count for everyone to play the music together. Well, this man set out to put a big band together of just girls who were top flight musicians. These girls were 11, 12, and 13 years old. And by the time they became prominent during their time period, they were the best in their field. They were from Mississippi, but they played all over the world and they were from all over the world. Oh sure, they were from China, they were from Puerto Rico, they were from here, African-American, European-American. And they rivaled Duke Ellington, they rivaled Count Basie, they rivaled uh, Cab Calloway, Billy Eckstein, you name them, and they were right there with them. The band that I'm referring to is the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. The International Sweethearts of Rhythm. It was formed in 1931. They disbanded in 1954. One of the greatest big bands of all time. And here they are with an original. Thank you. 
International Sweethearts of Rhythm, one of the greatest big bands of all time. And you know, fortunately, they were not the only all woman big band during their time period. There were hundreds and hundreds of big bands from coast to coast that were made up of strictly just women. And as a matter of fact, they made up over half of the big band population during the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And not too much is heard of them. However, there is a book that you could definitely pick up called Swing Shift, which describes all of these great, great big bands of just women. You know, whenever they would call a lot of these ladies to perform with the guys, the ladies would have to be able to play over 10, 12 instruments. This next lady was from Chattanooga as well, and she played over 25 instruments, including the violin and the cello. She was Louis Armstrong's nemesis. As a matter of fact, Louis Armstrong, the great trumpeter from New Orleans, had said that she was a woman who outplayed him. This lady was one of the greatest actresses and one of the greatest civil rights leaders of all time during her time period. Her name was Valeda Snow. Valeda Snow born on June the 2nd, 1903, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Passed away in New York City on May the 30th, 1956, at the very tender age of 52. Unfortunately, she was imprisoned in Copenhagen during World War II. And she was treated very unfairly by the Nazis during that time. She came home with a few mental problems and passed away at a very, very early age, at the age of 52. However, again, before she left, she left us with a wonderful legacy of her music. And she was one of the first Hollywood actresses way, way, way before Dorothy Dandridge, the latest snow. Here she is in a vocalese situation, a small group ensemble, that was recorded in 1947. The name of this one is, It's the Mood That I'm In. <laughs> opportunity to meet her just prior to her passing away. One of the greatest pianists, one of the greatest piano players of all time. You know, the flute and any other what we call linear instrument is just that. You play one note at a time and the music is written horizontally on the paper. And there is absolutely no problem in just reading linear, linearly the music. Not a 
problem whatsoever. But a pianist must do two tasks, perform two tasks at once. They must read the music vertically, the notes stacked on top of each other, which are called chords, and then they must read the music line linearly, which is horizontally, and they must do all of these things simultaneously. What I call split screen. I tried and tried and tried. I could never, ever be an accomplished pianist, never. But this lady was the genius. She was the master of the piano. As a matter of fact, she was one of the greatest stride pianists and one of the greatest composers and arrangers of all time. Mary Lou Williams. Mary Lou Williams, born in Atlanta on May 8th, 1910, passes away in Chicago on May 20, pardon me, passes away in Durham, North Carolina on May 28th, 1981 at the tender age of 71. And that's where I met her in Durham, North Carolina at Duke University. There is a cultural center named after her, one of the, one of the most sweetest spirits I have ever met in my life. She was also a walking institution. You know, I attended Berkeley College of Music. I graduated with a master's degree from Rutgers University in composing and arranging. I spent years and years and years studying as an undergrad in four or five, three or four different colleges in the Midwest. But these ladies were their own college. They were their own university and never had one day of formal, formal education. Now, it says stride pianist, which simply means that she's keeping the, the rhythm going with her left hand with chords, and she's embellishing the melody with the right hand all at the same time. Here is Mary Lou Williams, in a small group ensemble situation recorded in 1955. next lady started her career at the age of 10. That's right, at the age of 10. She was abandoned by her mother. She very, she didn't, she scarcely knew her father. And when she finally met her father, when she became of age, she revered him. One of the greatest vocalists to ever grace this planet. She was hounded by the FBI and by that coward, J. Edgar Hoover, who had put a hit out on her because she had recorded a composition that depicted Black men swinging from poplar trees in Mississippi and other places in the South because lynching was the order of the day during her time period. The U.S. government had warned her not to sing this 
composition that she wrote and that she was ripped off of because you see during this time period not too many negroes knew about the business of music so the record companies would hear their compositions and they would notate them musically notate them and then rip them off with no problem this was one of the greatest civil rights leaders one of the greatest actresses and one of the greatest vocalists of all time from Philadelphia, PA, her name was Eleonora Fagan, better known as Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday, born on April 17th, 1915 in Philadelphia, passes away handcuffed to a hospital bed on July 17th, 1959 in New York City at the tender age of 44. And when I mentioned that she was hounded by the US government, they would plant drugs on her and they would frame her often because she didn't heed the warning of her not performing or performing rather that famous composition called Strange Fruit. Here is Eleonora Fagan, Billie Holiday, in a small group ensemble situation recorded in 1949. The name of this one is entitled, You Can't Take That Away. <laughs> There's a movie that will be released, or it has been released, I'm not quite sure, of Lady Day. Lady Day versus the United States, and it depicts that this coward by the name of Esslinger, who happened to be one of the flunkies for J. Edgar Hoover during the 40s and 50s, who goes to Billie Holiday's performances in venues, rather, and plants drugs on her and accuses her of being a person who would consume these drugs. Billie Holiday, one of the great ones. There was a lady from Newport News, Virginia, who was commonly called Lady Day's nemesis, but she really wasn't. She was a lady who got along with Billie Holiday quite, quite nicely. She was a fighter, and she was constantly a winner of the Wednesday night, amateur night at the Apollo. Every Wednesday during the 30s and 40s, there would be amateur night at the Apollo Theater. This lady won so many times that they asked her, do not come back. Oh, she would come in tattered clothes, but and it was only $10. But the way she put that vocalese down was unbelievable. 
And she grew and developed into one of the greatest American songbook vocalists of our time. She recorded over 1,500 compositions. And not only that, she crossed genres. She would sing country western, she would sing the jazz, and one of her few recordings she made with Earth, Wind, and Fire in 1991 or 1992. She was the late, great Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald, born in Newport News on April 25th, 1917. Passes away in Beverly Hills, California on June the 15th, 1996, at the very young age of 79. Quincy Jones, when he finds out that, that she is on her way off the planet, sends different orchestras and bands to her home almost on a weekly basis until she leaves. One of the greatest honors that one could have is to perform for Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald. Here she is in a nursery rhyme situation that was recorded in 1938 that fortunately you can check out as a video on YouTube. And the name of this one is entitled A Tisket, A Tasket. A tisket, a tasket, a brown and yellow basket. I send a letter to my mommy on the way I dropped it. I dropped it, I dropped it. Yes, on the way I dropped it, a little girly picked it up and put it in her pocket. She was trucking on down the avenue, but not a single thing to do. She went peck, peck, pecking all around. When she spied it on the ground, she took it, she took it, my little yellow basket. And if she doesn't bring it back, I think that I will die. Ella Fitzgerald, one of the geniuses of her time period. You know, the ladies were heavily involved in the civil rights uh, period, and they were great, great organizers of the March on Washington during that heavy, heavy, turbulent time of the 60s. Specifically 1963, when the Great March on Washington happened, where over 300,000 people converged onto the mall in Washington, D.C. Both black, white, rich, poor, Jews, Christians, Muslims, young, old, you name it. They were there, icons, non-icons. People wanted to be a part of righting the wrongs that were done to people of color in this country. And that's exactly what had happened. This lady was responsible for being one of the organizers of that march, along with people like Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn and others who were in the jazz and music field. This lady was one of the greatest Broadway stars of her time, and she was a great actor as well. She was in a 1930s movie with Louis Armstrong called Stormy Weather, and she smoked it down with her beauty and her understanding of what it meant to be a great actor. This lady from Brooklyn, New York, that's right, you had it right. Lena Horn, Lena Horn, born on June the 30th, 1917 in Brooklyn, New York, passes away in New York City on May the 9th, 2010, at the very tender age of 92. 
she has her own Broadway show at the age of 64, where she kicks her heels way above her head. One of the great ones. Here is Lena Horne in a big band situation. As a matter of fact, this is the Count Basie big band. And the name of this one is entitled, The Lady is a Tramp. I get too hungry for dinner at eight. I like the theater, but never come late. I never bother with people I hate. That's why the lady is a tramp. I don't like crap games with balance and earls. Won't go to Harlem in ermine and pearls. Don't dish the dirt with the rest of the girls. That's why the lady is a tramp. I like the free and fresh wind in my hair. Life without care. I'm broke. That's oak. Hate California. It's cold. You know what was so unique about all of these wonderful ladies that they had their own way of approaching the music and getting that message out there. They had their own musical DNA. And another thing too, it seems like they were all born around the same time. They didn't leave all around the same time, but they were all born just before the turn of the century and just after the turn of the century. You see, they were all pioneers where all of those who came after them became emulators, just pure emulators. These were the pioneers. You know, when I was coming up, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't have TV, so we listened to the records. We had a record changer, we called it, where you would put the arm over and you would stack the records up and then as the needle would come over to the side, a record would fall down and then the needle would come over and it would play the record. The most exciting part of that whole experience was to hear the scratches first and then you would hear the music. These records were 78, what we call 78 records, because if you drop them, they were so brittle, they were made out of brittle plastic, you would have to replace them because they would immediately break. And you would only hear one song on each side, which would only be about maybe two and a half, three minutes at the most. But then came along the 33 and a third record where we had to go out and buy a whole new system to play them. The 33 and the third record would, would play four and five selections on each side. And it should have afforded the artist with a greater share of the royalties and residuals, but it did not. As a matter of fact, for the ladies, their royalties and residuals declined while the guys escalated. This lady was called the Jezebel of Jazz because, you see, she went to her record company, Verve Records and Columbia Records, and demanded a greater share of her recording rights. You see, they would only make 1.0% of each unit that sold. She wanted five cents per album virtually unheard of, but you know what? She got it because she was a big, big icon during her time period from Chicago, the Jezebel of jazz, Miss Anita O'Day. Anita O'Day, born on October 18th, 1919 in Chicago, Illinois, passes away in New York City of a cardiac arrest on November 23rd, 2006, at the very young age of 87. But she made a pathway for those ladies who were being treated unfairly when it came to earning their way. 
Here is Anita O'Day, recorded at the 1958 Newport Jazz Festival in Newport, Rhode Island. Now, if you take great notice to this photo here, this photo was taken outdoors because the jazz festival, of course, was outdoors. And if you notice, she's wearing white gloves and a large hat, and it looks like she's going to a very formal affair, but this was taken outdoors. And the people who attended were in jacket and tie and long dresses with high heels. Here she is. The name of this one is Sweet Georgia Brown. Jezebel of jazz, one of the great ones. You know, I'm originally from Montclair, New Jersey. And I grew up in an area where we often saw the icons during that time period of the music, both male and female. But this lady we would see often. And when we saw her, as a matter of fact, we saw her so often we didn't consider her as an icon. We just would say, well, there she is. And, but as she grew and grew and grew into this great, great vocalist, folk would just stop in awe and want to get her autograph. And sometimes she would be willing to give it up and sometimes she would not. But she was one of the greatest living, walking institutions of her time. From Newark, New Jersey, Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan, born on March the 27th, 1924 in Newark, New Jersey, passes away in Beverly Hills, California on April 3rd, 1990, a very, very, very young age of 66, but she performs all over the world. She takes her talent to every single continent on the planet. She is one of the great ones. And I had the opportunity to meet her and play opposite her at Lincoln Center in 1989, just a year prior to her passing away. One of the highlights of my career, Sarah Vaughan. Here she is in a small group ensemble situation, and the name of this one is East of the Sun. <laughs>
Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan. She was called the diva, the one who had that velvety voice. Well, this lady, the next lady, was from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. She was born in Tuscaloosa, but she had most of her musical training and most of her recordings happened in Chicago. And she grew up pretty much in Chicago. She was one of the greatest vocalists of all time and one of the greatest civil rights leaders of all time as well. Her name was Ruth Lee Jones, better known as Dinah Washington. Dinah Washington, born on August 29th, 1924 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, passes away in New York City on December the 14th, 1963, of an accidental barbiturate overdose. She is another lady who transcends the different genres of the music, from jazz to R&B and back to jazz again. She is one of the highest paid performers during her short time period here on this earth. Because of her 39 years on this planet, she records and performs all over the world. Here is a 1962 recording of Lover Come Back live in New York City. was new and so was love this eager heart of mine is singing lover where can you be you came at last love had its day that day is past you gone away this aching heart of mine is singing lover come on back to me well I remember every little thing we used to do I'm so lonely every road I walk alone I've walked alone with you no I wonder I am lonely the sky is blue the night is cold the moon is new but love is old and while I'm waiting here this heart of mine is singing lover lover come back to me Ruth Lee Jones the late great Dinah Washington well, ladies and gentlemen, our time is growing very, very close to the end of this segment. However, there's one lady that I'd like to highlight, uh, additional lady that I'd like to highlight, and she happens to be one of the greatest vocalists of all time. Her music is banned from the airways pretty much. As a matter of fact, record companies would play games with most of the artists during this time period, especially the Black artists. They would wait until the time period that they recorded the music has passed, or either they would wait until they passed away, the artist would pass away, and then they would release their music. They would keep the music in what is commonly known as in the can. And what made it even worse is that even if the music was allowed to be released by the record companies, a lot of times the radio stations would not play it. It was banned from the airways. Why? Because the music carried such a heavy message. And that's how heavy these artists were, because they composed their own compositions. This lady was one of the greatest European classical pianists. She had no problem in memorizing Franz Liszt, Bartok, Brahms, Beethoven, Handel, you name it. She wanted to be the first 
African-American to perform at Carnegie Hall, but her dreams were dashed only because of the melanin in her skin. All of the foolishness that was going on and still going on in this country only because of the color of her skin. The Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia had issued her an award posthumously because they had deemed her one of the greatest artists of our time, but they refused her entrance when she wanted to enroll in that particular school and only because of the color of her skin. This lady, one of the greatest vocalists, one of the greatest pianists of all time, Nina Simone, Eunice Wyman, Eunice Wyman, born on February the 21st, 1933 in Tryon, North Carolina, passes away in the south of France on April 21st, 2003 at the age of 70. But before she leaves, she leaves us with wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful library of compositions that she wrote and a lot of these compositions are now being released so we can enjoy them. Here is one that was banned. And this one was recorded during the times of the lynchings in 1963 and 1964. Here it is. The name of this tune is Mississippi Goddamn. I mean every word of it. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn. Alabama's got me so upset. Tennessee made me lose my rest. And everybody knows about Stand the pressure much longer Somebody say a prayer Alabama's got me so upset Tennessee made me lose my rest And everybody knows about Mississippi Goddamn This is a show tune But the show hasn't been written for it yet Hound dogs on my trail, school children sitting in jail, black cat cross my path. I think every day's gonna be my last. Lord have mercy on this land of mine. We all gonna get it in due time. I don't belong here, I don't belong there. I've even stopped believing in. Don't tell me, I'll tell you Me and my people just about do I've been there so I know You keep on saying, go slow Eunice Wyman, Nina Simone
you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that you learned a couple of things from the presentation. Are there any questions or comments?